Welcome to Voices in Value-Based Care. I'm Beth Houck. Thanks for tuning in. The movement to value-based care is revolutionizing how healthcare providers get reimbursed for delivery of care. In this program, we're going to explore stories from the field about how real organizations are dealing with this change. You can follow the show on Twitter at hashtag Voices in BBC and follow me on Twitter at B.A. Houck. On the program today, I talk to Dr. William Faber, Director at Navigate Consulting. Dr. Faber, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Beth. Glad to be here. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. I have had the opportunity to benefit from hearing some of your thought leadership with some of our customers, and in particular, your thought leadership on physician engagement. So I think we're going to have a great conversation today. I wonder if you'd mind just starting out by uh, telling the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe just kind of your background and how you transitioned into this role at Navigate. Sure, thanks a lot. Well, I'm a board certified family medicine doctor and I saw patients for 27 years in clinical practice while I was kind of going up a ladder that I never intended to go up in medical management um, early on, not long after residency, I started asking, why do we do it this way? This seems inefficient. Uh, the patients are not benefiting. Or this is wasting the doctor's time. And the next thing you know, someone asked me to be a medical director. And those medical director jobs got larger and larger. Eventually, I got a management degree. And eventually, I gave up seeing patients, which was really difficult to do. But the roles became large, and I got to have the privilege, frankly, of being a chief medical officer of a hospital, and I've worked with many clinically integrated networks. And most recently, in the last few years, I've been going around the country to multiple markets, setting up clinically integrated networks. And those, for listeners who may not know technically what they are, they're all about organizing our healthcare resources, hospitals, facilities, doctors, and others around providing value of care, which is what this whole series is about. Well, this is definitely why we're talking to you, because you have so much experience and so many stories. You know, I think when, when you and I were talking a bit, one of the things that I was thinking through is, what, what kinds of things could I ask you about? Because you have such a breadth of knowledge, and we could talk likely for an hour. But I think it all boiled down to starting our conversation with that number one question that continues to get asked even after you feel like you've answered it. And that is, how do you increase physician engagement? So one of the key tenets of value-based care arrangements is, of course, ensuring that you have really good physician engagement. Can you start by just talking about, how do you just start by just organizing yourself to increase physician engagement? There are so many things you can do to increase your productive interaction with physicians. I've been discouraged a few times in the past when I've seen administrators talk about physicians in kind of a control and command fashion as though they were workers on an assembly line. And of course, physicians are professionals. And I think they deserve respect. They have worked hard for what they do. They've got expertise. And they are really well-intended almost all the time. They really want their patients to get better. So great engagement starts with a respectful relationship. And it takes time to build a relationship. But one of the things that we'll talk about is putting physicians in governance. So often when I speak to physicians about the changes in healthcare, they feel like things are being done to them. This is not what they signed up for. They thought they would be independent professionals out there doing the best they could for patients individually. And now more and more regulations and oversight and the requirements of payers and technical issues like electronic health records are crowding into their lives. And they feel so often like things are being done to them. And one of the things I approach doctors with is the premise, if you don't want things just done to you, please roll up your sleeves with us and get involved in the decision-making. 
process. So systems and the leaders of systems can go a long way by providing forums for doctors to have meaningful input into the clinical programs that are going to deliver value and how things are going to be run. Um, They may not be operators by training, although in fact they are operators many times by training in a different way, not business operators, but they're smart and they are good at problem solving. And if you'll give them the parameters of the constraints that we live within, you know, there's only so much money to go around, so many human resources. I find that doctors can get very creative and constructive if they're given the respect to convene around that problem and their voices are really listened to about potential solutions. In a clinically integrated network, uh, the area in which I've been working in a more specialized way in the last 10 years, governance is a given. You need to have certain bodies, the board and its subcommittees, populated by physicians. And I've found that to be extremely effective when the doctors choose the quality metrics, they have a voice in what kind of contracts the network will engage in, etc. But even in places where there's not a clinically integrated network, whenever there's a, an enterprise effort to create value, find ways to convene physicians in groups, committees, We'll talk later about not wasting their time, but making it a worthwhile exercise where they get together and really get to help solve the problem. It goes a long, long way towards engagement. Is it hard to recruit them? So you mentioned kind of your pitch. You know, hey, if you see something you don't like, let's get involved. Roll up your sleeves and help us solve the problem. You You said a little bit about how you came to be in more of a physician leadership role. Is it hard to find people to fit into this position governance that you set up? Great question, because it is, in fact, a challenge. Doctors are generally busy people, and you don't want ones that aren't busy being in governance. In other words, if they aren't very invested in what they're doing, they may not make good governors. So you're going to be reaching out to people that are busy and getting paid to provide care. And it's difficult. You know, lots of them don't get home till 7 or 8 o'clock at night, and here's another evening of the month or another early morning breakfast meeting or another lunch that interferes with their rounding to participate in governance. But here's what I found out to be true. If I can find a few who are very passionate about improving health care and they are tired of having things done to them, and I can get them to come along, and create a meaningful environment, uh, a respectful and supportive environment for which, in which they can govern, then they bring their colleagues along. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've helped put together a quality committee or a board for a clinically integrated network, and it was kind of begging to get the people to show up the first time. But by the third or fourth meeting, the doctors were actively involved and excited about coming, and it became their preferred meeting, and they tell their colleagues, and the fire spreads that way from one doctor influencing their colleagues. We'll talk a little bit more about how to make sure that their participation in those committees and in those forums is best arranged to help bring them along more quickly, but once you find some that are willing, others will come along after. Let's go ahead and just go there. So that did beg the question for me is, what's the financial alignment that needs to be in place? How do you get them both willing but also appropriately compensated for doing these kinds of activities? Well, that's a good point. For a doctor to give up two hours or more for a meeting, they're foregoing an opportunity to use that two hours to earn an income through clinical activity. So I personally am a very strong proponent that you need to give them a stipend. The stipend is rarely going to be as much as they might have made clinically during that period of time, although overhead's not taken out of it. But it's a beautiful token that they really appreciate because you're asking them to give something up to be there. But beyond just paying them, and I'll I'll be candid, I think you've asked me this before, as I've gone around the country and I've been in markets from Philadelphia to San Diego doing this kind of work. Uh, The going rate right now is about $150 an hour as what's considered to be a reasonable stipend. 
for the doctors to have to come and uh, participate in governance activities. But I also want to say that in, in addition to paying them for their time or giving them token compensation for their time, make the meaning meaningful. Don't waste their time. That's what everybody hates. They don't want to come to a meeting that's not well uh, organized. There's been no advance communication. You don't know what the agenda is going to be. You haven't had a chance to read any requisite materials. And most importantly, you don't want to have doctors come just as an informational session. A good leader of a governance committee for a physician will boil it down to what critical question do we need to wrestle with here? Let's give you knowledge in the background. Let you read that before you come. Now let's make a tough decision in the meeting and hear different points of view. When the meeting is well organized, well paced, you start it on time, you let it out on time or early, and you get something done, I think that's just as engaging as paying them money. Yeah, that's a great great formula. I really appreciate all the detail too, I, even, including even the dollar amount, the stipend. So we talk, we're talking about engagement at the at leadership level, and that's, kind of, that's the start of it. Let's go down to now we have the, the governance in place, we have the, the physician leaders in place, and you have some value-based care arrangements, pay for performance initiatives, something going on, and you need to keep physicians engaged to row the boat in the same direction. What kind of reports or feedback do you give them to also be on board with whatever this program might be? Well, you're alluding to something we we know to be true, and that is even though doctors respond well to financial incentives for performance, doctors are by nature competitive people. They're overachievers. They are sensitive to feedback. They've been graded (laughs) against their colleagues in their chemistry class or whatever it may be for many, many years. And I always say no good doctor wants to be number 20 on a list of 20. And so if you give them a level playing field and feedback about their performance, it's been my experience for many, many years that they will try to improve. It's a matter of pride for them. And if the metrics are created in the proper way, they truly reflect activities that make their patients better, which again is the reason why most people went into medicine. They really care about the outcomes for their patients. So uh, monetary feedback is important, but good data feedback is important. What is good information for the physicians? Well, there are literally hundreds of quality metrics out there these days, and many different organizations require achievement on a a variety of metrics, although a lot of them boil down to the same set. There's a great deal of crossover between what Blue Cross requires and what your ACO requires, and NCQA may require and what meaningful use may require. And a typical one would be how well are you controlling your diabetic population? And the way you measure that is with a blood test called a hemoglobin A1C. It's a a measure of people's average blood sugar over time. When you give doctors a report, please keep these guiding principles in mind. Make sure that the report is accurate. And I can tell you, when an organization is new at reporting, there is essentially always there are bugs in the system. And so the attitude with which you give doctors feedback is as important as the report itself. When I was a young medical director, I would go out with that report in hand as though it was the gospel truth, and I would unfortunately make judgments. And of course, human beings make judgments, but please try to withhold judgment and instead go out with those first reports and say to the doctor, this is the first report. Can you help me validate whether this is accurate or not? When I was a young medical director, sometimes an old crabby doctor like the age I am now would snatch it out of my hand and say, let me look at that. And they would rightfully point out things like, well, look at this. Mrs. Jones on my report. She's been dead for three years. Please, you've got to get her off of my attribution list. And this one moved to California. And this one says he sees me, but he always sees Dr. Jones in the next office over or doctors will often say, well, my patients are sicker than the other person's patients, so it's not a level playing field. And of course, if every doctor says that, it can't be true. But in fact, some patient populations are sicker than others. 
So the data should be risk adjusted. You ought to give people credit for the situation that they're trying to make better uh, relative to the illness burden of their patients. Another one that really bothers me is we'd go out and talk to doctors about their patient satisfaction, CG caps or press Ganey score results, and it would jump all over the place. They'd be in the 88th percentile one month and down at the 12th percentile the next month and back up to the 64th and down at 17. And the administrators would act as though, oh, this is a reflection of how nice the doctor is being to their patients. And the doctor would say, no, I treat my patients the same in June as I did in December and every month in between. And then we look. And the end size or the number of responses that would come back to the doctor per month might be as few as three or five or two. Well, anybody who studied statistics knows that if you've got such a small sample, all it takes is one or two patients to be outliers, and it throws off your statistical validity completely. So I always made it a rule in my organizations, please hold any response to the doctor till at least 30 of those reports had come through, because then and only then is it going to be a valid kind of feedback to give them. And if that means you can only talk to them about their patient satisfaction three times a year or four times a year, so be it. You can aggregate the data across hundreds of doctors and get some general idea where the organization is going. But for micromanagement or giving doctors specific feedback on their performance, You have to look at things like attribution, whether the report is clean, whether it's been adjusted for the severity of your illness and has an adequate end size to be statistically valid. And then over time, if you listen to the doctor's feedback and you make sure that those points are strong and that the report is clean and accurate, then the doctors will really respond to the data. Now they believe in the data. But please be very careful when you go out in the initial stages because some of these things have not been worked out yet. No doubt. I I think I've experienced it, not as a young medical director, but perhaps as a young data analyst. So I know know what you're talking about. I I wonder, one of the things I hear a lot of practices struggling with, health systems struggling with, is both the volume of information to give people and the frequency. And I'd imagine it's not a one-size-fits-all, but what kinds of best practices have you seen out there around both how much information to give people and how frequently to put it in front of them? Another great question from my point of view, and my perspective is derived from years of seeing this actually play out. Monthly meetings around data are probably too frequent. Quarterly makes a lot more sense. And of course, you're going to get much better meeting attendance if you tell the doctors we're only going to take your Thursday night once a quarter than once a month. It becomes intolerable. There's just so many hours in the day and so much we're all trying to get to. So even if there's a portal by which the doctor can go in and pull down information rather than having it disseminated at a meeting, we really need to limit the breadth of the reporting. One of my sayings is you can't have 10 number one priorities. And yet many systems that I've worked in act as though you can focus on 10 things simultaneously and maximize all of them. Uh, So I think fewer quality metrics, fewer reports, but the most important quality metric and the most accurate quality metric is going to get you further down the line than uh, the scattershot approach that's so often used. I think people who are working with data all day long and not trying to take care of patients sometimes think more is better. Oh, let's just give them all this data point. But the mind clouds over. that You can't take it all in, and you can't take it all in when you're in a hurry. So when I was at Advocate, where I learned a lot of my uh, clinical integration and quality improvement and uh, work, where where I learned a lot of these principles, we got up to the point where we had 155 quality metrics across the organization. And 55 of those pertain to family practice doctors, such as myself. And I still clearly remember the meeting. This was at least 10 or 12 years ago, where we said, we're way past the point of diminishing the turns. We're going to pare these down. So 
as I go out and help organizations start up, I recommend that you don't start with more than 20 to 25 metrics altogether. And you don't have a doctor or their team focus on more than about 20 to 30 maximally, even over time. There's 40 some different specialties. Specialties often require different kinds of quality metrics. More happen to hit a primary care doctor than, than any other kind of doctor. But I would strongly urge everybody to keep the list small at first and over time expand it if everybody is able to assimilate and actually show performance. And that requires leadership and the doctors and these committees to make tough decisions. Is this a better metric or is that a better metric? Let's let the most potent, useful metrics that really change the, the health of the population, let's let those rise to the top and concentrate on a few things. And then when we get those better, then we can either retire the measure, put that on hold, or introduce a few more because we've come up with a system to manage the complexity of all that data. You know, one of the things that we've been hearing even more of recent is organizations choosing measures that can be fulfilled by people other than the clinician themselves, rest of their their care team, nurses, med, med assistants. So I'd imagine that there's been more investment being made in kind of the practices themselves. So trying to get really the team approach running more smoothly. Are, are you seeing that same kind of thing ha- play out in the market in support both of these metrics, but in support of this the physician engagement so that the physicians themselves aren't burnt out. They have a more bigger team kind of supporting them. Yes. I'm a big fan of people other than just the doctor themselves collecting the data and moving the needle on performance on each one of these metrics. And we shouldn't feel bad about that. I think one of the reasons why so many doctors burn out is because they themselves personally or the systems that they work in haven't emphasized more of a team approach. I always think of my orthodontist when I had braces. I was perfectly satisfied with my orthodontist, but he ran five chairs at once. And he would have somebody at each chair with the patient. And when he'd say, oh, put a band on five and take this one off on three and adjust such and such a wire, then he'd wash his hands and move on to the next patient. He'd greet me with some funny story or whatever. He was only seeing me like three minutes. The other person was spending 15 minutes with me, and we were all served as patients. <laughs> all those people had jobs. The orthodontist collected, I'm sure, plenty of money uh, with his portion of each one, and, and it worked like a well-oiled team. And I think we need to do that more, particularly in primary care. There's a primary care shortage. I'm a big fan of nurse practitioners and PAs assisting. They can do so much. They themselves would say they need the leadership of the doctor in some certain situations. That's why you went to med school, but reserve the the tough decisions for the doctors. Well, the same is true with quality improvement. So much of what makes the patient better is your MA chasing down the gaps in your gap analysis. They can call up the patients who haven't had their blood test result or who aren't filling their prescription, and they can take care of that directly. And So many of the patients that are really difficult to manage who end up in the hospital a lot can be helped by the care manager that's down the hall or on the phone, but I I prefer the embedded ones that are down the hall whenever possible because the patient feels well served by that team member as well, as long as they know they've got access to the doctor. Well, here's the irony of this whole line of thinking. We haven't talked much about financial incentives other than paying the doctors to come to meetings, but I want to talk about the importance of aligning the compensation plan of the physician with the improvement of the metric, because that really helps get their head in the game. I'll go back to the fact that doctors primarily want to make their patients better, and they're not necessarily in it to make more money. But if there is a pay-for-value program or a shared savings program, it's important that the money trickle down to the providers for a couple of reasons. Nobody works against their own best interests. So why would a doctor put time and effort into some of these other activities in a 
strictly fee-for-service world where they're not going to get paid to do them. Again, it's philosophically aligning their incentives so they don't feel like they're working against themselves. But I think it's also legitimate that the doctor gets a payout on the quality performance, even though a team helped deliver it, because they are the leader of the team. And one of the main things doctors can do to improve quality is to endorse the activity to the patient. They have such powerful influence over the patients and what the patients are willing to do that if I, the doctor, say, you should see Marianne, she's your care coordinator, and she's going to help you avoid hospitalization by helping you get your medicine and your transportation and understand what's going on with you. That enables Mary to do her part as a teammate. So what I'm saying in summary is let's get all the right people working for the improvement of the measure and ultimately the betterment of the patient so that everybody can work at the top of their license and you can pay those people that are on the team organizationally with money that comes out of the shared savings program, but also give the doctors a reasonable part of that incentive because they drive the overall direction of the team. Well, that is a fantastic summary. I don't know if you even realized we did, we were running out of time, but that's a fantastic summary. We covered all kinds of ground. I love the orthodontia analogy, perhaps, because I have kids in braces, but I I imagine I've seen you, so you did turn out with straight teeth, and so if we can, you know, kind of keeping that parallel alive, you know, turn out the patients with, air quote, straight teeth, uh, but by employing this, you know, kind of team approach, I think it's a, a really exciting time for healthcare. Thanks so much. Thanks for being on the show. We really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Faber, and thanks to our audience for tuning in. You can learn more about the show on the program's page on healthcarenowradio.com and lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at hashtag Voices in BBC. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at VA Houck. I'm Beth Houck, bringing you the voices and value-based care you should hear. Until next time, have a great week. 